In the Bimmer's kitchen, the light in the oven clock cast a soft green glow that barely illuminated the room, but even that was bright enough to make most of the details visible and to keep Joey close to the floor. Two windows, one over the sink, the other beside a breakfast table. Both had side panel curtains and, better yet, vinyl roll-up blinds that were drawn halfway down. Cautiously rising to his feet at the side of the breakfast table with his back pressed to the wall, he reached out and pulled that blind all the way over the glass. Breathing hard, both from exertion and fear, he was bizarrely convinced that P.J. had circled the house and was now directly behind him, outside, with only the wall between them. In spite of the wind and rain, maybe P.J. could track him by his loud breathing and would shoot him through the wall to which his back was pressed. The moment passed, and the shot in the spine didn't come, and his terror abated somewhat. Although he would have preferred that Celeste remain on the floor below any possible line of fire, she risked a bullet in the arm by drawing the blind at the sink window. You okay, he asked, when they eased back to the floor and met again in the center of the kitchen, staying on their knees in spite of having secured the two windows. They're all dead, aren't they? She whispered bleakly. Yeah. All three? Yeah. No chance? No. Dead. I've known them all my life. I'm sorry. Beth used to babysit me when I was little. The eerie green glow from the oven clock made the Bimmer kitchen shimmer as though it were underwater and had passed through a veil into an unnatural realm outside the flow of real time and ordinary events. But the quality of the light alone could not provide him with blessed detachment, and his gut remained knotted with tension. His throat was so constricted that he could barely swallow. Fumbling spare shells from his pockets, dropping them through his shaky fingers, Joey said softly, It's my fault. No, it's not. He knew where they were, where to find them. He knows who's still left in town and where they live. We didn't lead him here. He'd have come on his own anyway. The dropped shells rolled away from him as he tried to recover them. His fingers were half numb and his hands were shaking so badly that he gave up trying to reload until he calmed down. Joey was surprised that his heart could still beat. It felt like cold iron in his chest. They listened to the deadly night, alert for the stealthy sound of a door slowly easing open or the telltale clink of broken glass underfoot. Eventually, he said, Back home, earlier, when I found the body in the trunk of his car, if I'd called the sheriff then and there, none of these people would be dead now. You can't blame yourself for that. Who the hell else should I blame? He was instantly ashamed that he responded so harshly. When he spoke again, his voice was bitter and remorseful, but his anger was directed at himself, not at her. I knew the right thing to do, and I didn't do it. Listen, she said, finding one of his hands in the green gloom, holding it tightly. That's not what I meant when I said you couldn't blame yourself. Think about it, Joey. Not calling the sheriff, you made that mistake twenty years ago. You didn't make it tonight, because your second chance didn't begin with P.J. at the house today, didn't begin with the finding of the body. It began only when you reached Coal Valley Road, right? Well, you weren't given a second chance to turn him into the sheriff earlier. But twenty years ago, I should have... That's history. Terrible history. And you'll have to live with that part of it. But now all that matters is what happens from here on. Nothing counts except how you chose, and continue to choose, to handle things after you took the right highway tonight. I haven't handled them well so far, have I? Three people dead. Three people who would have died anyway, she argued, who probably did die the first time you lived through this night. It's horrible. It's painful. But it looks as if that part of it was meant to be, and there's no changing it. Sinking deeper into anguish, Joey said, Then what's the point of being given a second chance if it isn't to save these people? You might be able to save others before the night is through. But why not all of them? I'm screwing up again. Stop beating yourself up. It's not for you to decide how many people you can save, how much you can change destiny. In fact, maybe the purpose of being given a second chance wasn't to save anyone in Coal Valley. Except you. Maybe not even me. Maybe I can't be saved either. Her words left him speechless. She sounded as though she could accept the possibility of her own death with equanimity, while for Joey the thought of failing her was like a hammer blow to the heart. She said, It may turn out that the only thing you can really accomplish tonight is to stop P.J. from going on from here. Stop him from committing twenty more years of murder. Maybe that's the only thing expected of you, Joey. Not saving me. 
not saving anyone. Just stopping PJ from doing even worse than what he'll do tonight. Maybe that's all God wants from you. There's no God here. No God in Coal Valley tonight. She squeezed his hand, digging her fingernails into his flesh. How can you say that? Go look at the people in the living room. That's stupid. How can a God of mercy let people die like that? Smarter people than us have tried to answer the same question. And can't. But that doesn't mean there isn't an answer, she said with rising anger and impatience. Joey, if God didn't give you the chance to relive this night, then who did? I don't know, he said miserably. You think maybe it was Rod Serling, and now you're stuck in the Twilight Zone, she asked scornfully. No, of course not. Then who? Maybe it was just, just an anomaly of physics, a random fold in time, an energy wave, inexplicable and meaningless. I don't know. How the hell could I know? Oh, I see. Just some mechanical breakdown in the great cosmic machinery, she said sarcastically, letting go of his hand. Seems to make more sense than God. So we're not in the Twilight Zone, huh? Now we're aboard the Starship Enterprise with Captain Kirk, assaulted by energy waves, catapulted into time warps. He didn't reply. She said, You remember Star Trek? Anyone still remember it up there in 1995? Remember? Hell, I think maybe it's a bigger industry than General Motors. Let's bring a little cool Vulcan logic to the problem, okay? If this amazing thing that happened to you is meaningless and random, then why did you get folded back in time to some boring day when you were eight years old and had the puking flu? Or why not to some night a month ago, when you were just sitting in your trailer out in Vegas, half drunk, watching old Roadrunner cartoons or something? You think some random anomaly of physics would just by purest chance bring you back to the most important night of your life, this night of all nights, to the very moment it all went wrong, beyond any hope of recovery? Just listening to her had calmed him, although his spirits had not been lifted. At least he was able to pick up the spilled shells and reload his shotgun. Maybe, she said... You're living this night again not because there's something you have to do, not to save lives and bring down PJ and be a hero. Maybe you're living this night again only so you'll have one last chance to believe. In what? In a world with meaning. In life with some greater purpose. At times she seemed to have the uncanny ability to read his mind. More than anything, Joey wanted to believe in something again, as he had when he'd been an altar boy so many years ago. But he vacillated between hope and despair. He remembered how filled with wonder he'd been a short while ago when he'd realized that he was twenty again, how grateful he had been to something, someone for the second chance. But already it was easier to believe in the twilight zone or in a fluke of quantum mechanics than in God. Believe, he said. That's what P.J. wanted me to do. Just believe in him. Believe in his innocence without one shred of proof. And I did. I believed in him. And look where that got me. Maybe it wasn't believing in P.J. that ruined your life. It sure didn't help, he said sourly. Maybe the main problem was that you didn't believe in anything else. I was an altar boy once, he said, but then I grew up. I got an education. Having gone to college a little, you surely heard the word sophomoric, Celeste suggested. It describes the kind of thinking you're still indulging in. You're really wise, huh? You know it all? Nope, I'm not wise at all, not me. But my dad says admitting you don't know everything is the beginning of wisdom. Your dad, the jerkwater high school principal, suddenly he's a famous philosopher. Now you're just being mean, she said. After a while, he said, sorry. Don't forget the sign I was given, my blood on your fingertips. How can I not believe? More important, how can you not believe after that? You called it a sign yourself. I wasn't thinking. I was all emotional. When you take time to think about it, apply just a little of that cool Vulcan logic you mentioned. If you think hard enough about anything, you won't be able to believe in it. If you saw a bird fly across the sky the moment it's out of sight, there's no way to prove it existed. How do you even know Paris exists? Have you ever been there? Other people have seen Paris. I believe them. Other people have seen God. Not the way they've seen Paris. There are a lot of ways to see, she said, and maybe neither your eyes nor a Kodak is the best way. How can anyone believe in any god so cruel that he'd let three people die like that, three innocent people? If death isn't permanent, she said without hesitation, if it's only a transition from one world to the next, then it isn't necessarily cruel. 
So easy for you, he said enviously. So easy just to believe. It can be easy for you, too. No. Just accept. Not easy for me, he insisted. Then why even bother to believe that you're living this night again? Why not write it off as just a silly dream, roll over and go on sleeping, and wait to wake up in the morning? He didn't answer. He couldn't. Although he knew it was pointless to try, he crawled to the wall phone, reached up and pulled the receiver off the cradle. No dial tone. Can't possibly work, Celeste said with an edge of sarcasm. Huh? Can't work because you've had time to think about it, and now you realize there's no way to prove there's anyone else in the world to call. And if there's no way to prove beyond a doubt right here, right now, that other people exist, then they don't exist. You must have learned the word for that in college, solipsism. The theory that nothing can be proven except your own awareness. That there is nothing real beyond yourself. Letting the telephone handset dangle on its springy cord, Joey leaned his back against the kitchen cabinet and listened to the wind, to the rain, to the special hush of the dead. Eventually, Celeste said, I don't think PJ's going to come in after us. Joey had arrived at the same conclusion. PJ wasn't going to kill them. Not yet. Later. If PJ had wanted to waste them, he could have nailed them easily when they had been on the front porch, standing in the light with their backs to him. Instead, he carefully placed his first shot in the narrow gap between their heads, taking out John Bimmer with a perfectly placed bullet in the heart. For his own twisted reasons, P.J. evidently wanted them to bear witness to the murders of everyone in Coal Valley, then waste them. Apparently, he intended that Celeste should be the twelfth and final apostle in the freeze-frame drama that he was creating at the church. And me? Joey wondered. What do you have in mind for me, big brother? Chapter 14 The Bimmer kitchen was purgatory with linoleum floors and formica countertops. Joey waited to be propelled from that place either by events or by inspiration. There must be something that he could do to stop P.J. Nevertheless, merely proceeding to the Dolan house with the intention of preventing those five pending murders would be sheer folly. He and Celeste would only serve as witnesses to the deaths. Maybe they could slip into the Dolan place without anyone being shot down at the front door or at the windows. Maybe they could even convince the Dolans of the danger and conspire with them to turn the house into a fortress. But then P.J. only had to set a fire either to kill them where they hid or to drive them out into the night where he could shoot them down. If the Dolan house had an attached garage and if the Dolans could get in their car and make a run for it, P.J. would shoot out the tires as they tried to flee. Then he would kill them with a spray of gunfire while they were helpless in the disabled vehicle. Joey had never met the Dolan family. At that moment, convincing himself that they actually existed was, in fact, harder than he would have thought. How easy it would be to sit there in the kitchen and do nothing. Let the Dolans, if they existed, look out for themselves and believe only in the bottle-green shadows around him, the faint smell of cinnamon, the strong aroma of fresh coffee warming in the pot, the hard wood against his back, the floor beneath him, and the hum of the refrigerator motor. Twenty years ago, when he turned his back on the grisly proof of what his brother had done, he had been equally unable to believe in all the victims to come. Without their bloodied faces before him, without their battered bodies piled high, they had been as unreal to him as the citizens of Paris were unreal to a man convinced of the wisdom of solipsism. How many people had P.J. killed in those twenty years following the first passage of this night? Two per year? Forty in all? No. Too low. Killing that infrequently would be too little challenge, too little thrill. More than one a month for twenty years, two hundred and fifty victims, tortured, mutilated, dumped along back roads from one end of the country to the other, or buried in secret graves. P.J. seemed more than sufficiently energetic to handle that. By refusing to believe in future horrors, Joey had ensured that they would come to pass. For the first time, he was aware of the true size of his burden of responsibility, which was far greater than he wanted to believe. His acquiescence to P.J. on that long-ago night had resulted in a triumph of evil so enormous that now he was half-crushed by the belated recognition of its weight under which his soul was pinned. The ultimate consequences of inaction could be greater than the consequences of action. He wants us to go to the Dolan's place so I can see them being murdered, Joey said thickly. If we don't go right away, we'll be buying them a little time at least. We can't just sit here, she said. No, because sooner or later he'll go kill them anyway. Sooner, she predicted. 
While he's still watching us here, waiting for us to come out, we have to do something he's not expecting. Something that'll make him curious and keep him close to us, away from the Dolans. Something that'll surprise and unsettle him. Like what? The refrigerator motor. The rain. Coffee, cinnamon. The oven clock. Ticking. Ticking. Joey, she prodded. It's so hard to think of something that might rattle him, he said miserably. He's so sure of what he's doing, so bold. That's because he has something to believe in. PJ. Something to believe in. Himself. The sick creep believes in himself. In his cleverness and charm and intelligence, in his destiny. It's not much in the way of a religion, but he believes in himself with a real passion, which gives him a whole lot more than confidence. It gives him power. Celeste's words electrified Joey, but at first he didn't quite understand why. Then with sudden excitement he said, You're right. He does believe in something, but he doesn't believe only in himself. He believes in something else, all right. It's clear, isn't it? All the evidence is there, easy to see, but I didn't want to admit it. He believes. He's a true believer, and if we play into that belief, then we might be able to rattle him and get an advantage. I'm not following you, Celeste said worriedly. I'll explain later. Right now we don't have much time. You have to search the kitchen. See if you can find candles, matches, get an empty bottle or jar, and fill it with water. Why? Scrambling onto his feet but staying in a crouch, he said, Just find it if you can. I'll have to take the flashlight with me, so open the refrigerator door for more light if you need it. Don't turn on the overhead fluorescents. They're too bright. You'll throw a shadow on one of the blinds just when he's tired of waiting for us and ready to take a shot. As Joey headed toward the open door to the dining room, leaving Celeste alone in the green gloom, she said, Where are you going? The living room, and upstairs. There's some stuff I need. What stuff? You'll see. In the living room, he used the flashlight judiciously twice flicking it on and immediately off to orient himself and avoid the three dead bodies. The second burst of light revealed Beth Bimmer's wide eyes as she stared at something beyond the ceiling of the room, beyond the confines of the house, far above the storm clouds outside, somewhere past the North Star. To take down the crucifix, he had to climb onto the sofa and stand beside the body of the old woman. The long, affixing nail was driven not simply into plaster or drywall, but into a stud, and the head of it was larger than the brass loop through which it was driven, so he had to work hard to remove the stubborn cross from the wall. As he struggled in the darkness, he was afraid that Hannah's body would tip on its side and slump against his legs, but he managed to pry loose the prize and get down on the floor again without coming into contact with her. A third flick of the light, a fourth, and he was at the stairs. The second floor offered three small rooms and a bath, each revealed with a quick sweep of the flashlight. If B.J. was watching outside, perhaps his curiosity had begun to be pricked by Joey's exploration of the house. In spite of her advanced years and her cane, Hannah had slept on the second floor, and in her bedroom Joey found what he needed. A shrine to the Holy Mother stood in one corner on a three-legged table in the shape of a pie slice, a ten-inch tall ceramic statuette with a built-in three-watt bulb at the base which cast a fan of light over the Virgin. Also on the table were three small ruby-red glasses containing votive candles, all extinguished. Using the flashlight, he confirmed that the sheets on the bed were white, and then he pulled them off. He carefully bundled the statuette and other items in the sheets. He went down to the living room again. The wind was pushing through the broken window, tossing the drapes. He stood tensely at the foot of the stairs for a moment until he was certain that, in fact, nothing else was moving at the window besides those streaming panels of fabric. The dead remained dead, and in spite of the inrushing night air, the room stank like the inside of the car trunk in which the tarp-wrapped blonde had been kept. In the kitchen, the refrigerator door was open a few inches, and by that cold light, Celeste was still searching the cabinets. Found a half-gallon plastic jug, filled it with water, she said. Got some matches, too, but no candles yet. Keep looking, Joey said as he put down the sheet-wrapped articles from Hannah's room. In addition to the entrance to the dining room and the exit to the back porch, the kitchen contained a third door. He cracked it open. The influx of freezing air, bringing the faint scent of gasoline and motor oil, told him that he'd found the attached garage. Be right back, he said. The flashlight revealed that the only window in the garage was in the back wall and covered with a flap of oilcloth. He switched on the overhead light. An old but well-maintained Pontiac with a toothy chrome grin stood in the single stall. Beside a rough workbench was an unlocked cabinet that proved to be full of tools. After choosing the heftiest of three hammers, he searched through boxes of nails until he found the size that he needed. By the time Joey returned to the kitchen, Celeste had located six candles. 
Beth Bimmer evidently had bought them to decorate the house or the dining table at Christmas. They were about six inches tall, three to four inches in diameter, three red, three green, all scented with bayberry. Joey had been hoping for simple, tall, white candles. These will have to do. He opened the sack that he'd made by gathering the bed sheets, and he added the candles, matches, hammer, and nails to the items that he had collected earlier. What is all this, she asked. We're going to play into his fantasy. What fantasy? No time to explain. You'll see. Come on. She carried her shotgun and the half-gallon jug of water. He carried the makeshift sack in one hand and a shotgun in the other. Thus encumbered, if they were threatened, they wouldn't be able to raise a weapon and fire with any accuracy or in a timely enough fashion to save themselves. Joey was counting on his brother's desire to play games with them for a while yet. PJ was enjoying their fear, feeding on it. They left by the front door, boldly, without hesitation. The point was not to give PJ the slip, but to draw his attention and engage his curiosity. Joey's gut was clenched in dread anticipation of a rifle shot, not so much one aimed at him, but one that might smash the porcelain beauty of Celeste's face. They descended the porch steps into the rain, went to the end of the front walk, and turned left. They headed back toward Coal Valley Road. The series of mine vents along North Avenue set sixty feet on center suddenly whooshed like a row of gas stove burners being ignited all at once. Columns of baleful yellow fire shot through with tongues of blue erupted from the top of every pipe along the street. Celeste cried out in surprise. Joey dropped the bedsheet sack, grabbed the shotgun with both hands, spun to the left, swung to the right. He was so jumpy that he half thought PJ was somehow responsible for the spontaneous venting of the fires under the town. If he was nearby, however, P.J. did not reveal himself. Fire didn't merely flap like bright banners at the tops of the vent pipes and dissolve in the storm wind. Instead, it shot four or five feet above the iron rims, under considerable pressure, like flames from the nozzles of blowtorches. The ground didn't rumble as it had done earlier, but the fierce rush of gases escaping up those metal shafts from far below produced a great roar that vibrated in Joey's bones. Strangely, the sound had a disturbing quality of rage about it as though it had been produced not by natural forces, but by some colossus trapped in the inferno, and less pain than infuriated by it. What's happening? he asked, raising his voice, though Celeste was close beside him. I don't know. Ever see anything like this before? No, she said, looking around in fearful wonder. As though they were the pipes of a gargantuan carnival calliope, the vents pumped forth a midnight music of roars and growls and huffs and whistles and occasional mad shrieks. Echoes ricocheted off the smoke-mottled walls of the abandoned houses, off windows as dark as blind eyes. In the backwash of a spectral light from the ferocious gushes of fire, pterodactyl silhouettes swooped through the rain-shattered night. Mammoth shadows lurched across North Avenue as if thrown by an army of giants marching through the next street one block to the east. Joey picked up the bundle that he had dropped. With a sense that time was swiftly running out, he said, Come on, hurry. While he and Celeste sprinted along the deeply puddled street toward Coal Valley Road, the burn-off of subterranean gases ended as abruptly as it had begun. The queer light throbbed once, then again, and was gone. The flying, lurching shadows vanished into an immobilizing darkness. Rain turned to steam when it struck the fiercely hot iron pipes, and even above the sounds of the storm there arose a hissing, as if Coal Valley had been invaded by thousands upon thousands of serpents. Chapter 15 The doors of the church still stood open. The lights glowed softly inside as Joey had left them. After following Celeste into the narthex, he pulled the double doors shut behind them. The big hinges rasped noisily, as he had expected. Now, if P.J. followed them by that route, he would not be able to enter quietly. At the archway between the narthex and the nave, Joey indicated the marble font, which was as white as an ancient skull and every bit as dry. Empty the jug. Why? Just do it, he said urgently. Celeste propped her shotgun against the wall and unscrewed the cap from the half-gallon container. The water splashed and gurgled into the bowl. Bring the empty jug, Joey said. Don't leave it where he can see it. He led her down the center aisle, through the low gate in the sanctuary railing, along the ambulatory that curved around the choir enclosure. The body of Beverly Korshak, swaddled in heavy plastic, still lay on the altar platform, a pale mound. What now? Celeste asked, following him along the presbytery to the altar platform. 
Joey put down the white bundle behind the dead woman. Help me move her. Grimacing in disgust at the prospect of that task, Celeste said, Move her where? Out of the sanctuary into the sacristy. She shouldn't be here like this. It's a desecration of the church. This isn't a church anymore, she reminded him. It will be again soon. What are you talking about? When we're done with it. We don't have the power to make it a church again. That takes a bishop or something, doesn't it? We don't have the authority officially, no, but maybe that's not necessary to play into PJ's twisted fantasy. Maybe all we need is a little stage setting. Celeste, please help me. Reluctantly, she obliged, and together they moved the corpse out of the sanctuary and put it down gently in a corner of the sacristy, that small room where priests had once prepared themselves for mass. On the first visit to St. Thomas's, Joey had found the exterior sacristy door open. He had closed and locked it. When he checked it again, he found that the door was still securely locked. Another door opened onto a set of descending stairs. Gazing into that darkness, Joey said, You've gone to church here for most of your life, right? Is there an outside entrance to the basement? No, not even windows. It's all below ground. PJ wouldn't be able to get into the church that way either, which left only the front doors. Returning with Celeste to the sanctuary, Joey wished that they had been able to bring a card table or other small piece of furniture to serve as an altar but the low, bare platform itself would have to suffice. He unfolded the twisted ends of the sheets with which he had formed the sack, and he set aside the hammer, box of nails, red and green candles, votive candles, matches, crucifix, and statuette of the Holy Mother. At Joey's instruction, Celeste helped him cover the platform with the two white sheets. Maybe he nailed her to the floor while he did what he wanted, he said as they worked but he wasn't just torturing her. It meant more to him than that. It was a sacrilegious act, blasphemy. More likely than not, the whole rape and murder was part of a ceremony. Ceremony, she asked with a shudder. You said that he's strong and difficult to rattle because he believes in something, himself, you said, but I think he believes in more than that. He believes in the dark side. Satanism, she asked doubtfully. P.J. Shannon, football hero, Mr. Nice Guy. We both already know that person doesn't exist anymore, if he ever did. Beverly Korshak's body tells us that much. But he got a scholarship to Notre Dame, Joey, and I don't think they encourage black masses out there in South Bend. Maybe it all began right here, before he ever went away to the university or eventually to New York. It's so far out, she said. Here in 1975, okay, it's a little far out, he agreed as he finished straightening the sheets. But by 1995, a troubled high school kid getting into Satanism, it's not so unusual, believe me. And it was happening in the 60s and 70s, too, just not as often. I don't think I'd much like this 1995 of yours. You're not the only one. Did PJ seem troubled in high school? No. But sometimes the most deeply disturbed ones don't much show it. The cloth was pulled taut across the altar platform. Most of the wrinkles had been smoothed out. The white cotton seemed to be whiter now than when they had first unfolded the sheets. Radiant. Earlier, Joey reminded her, you said he behaves recklessly, so arrogantly it's as if he thinks he's blessed. Well, maybe that's exactly what he thinks. Maybe he thinks he's made a bargain that protects him. Now he can get away with just about anything. You're saying he sold his soul. No. I'm not saying there is a soul, or that it could be sold even if it existed. I'm only telling you what he might think he's done, and why that ugly little fantasy gives him such extraordinary self-confidence. We do have souls, she said quietly, firmly. Picking up the hammer and the box of nails, Joey said, bring the crucifix. He went to the back of the sanctuary where a twelve-foot-high carving of Christ in blessed agony had once hung. No overhead spots were focused on the wall. Instead, the plaster was washed with light from a pair of floor-mounted lamps. Because the rising light had been meant to lead the eye upward to the contemplation of the divine, he drove a nail into the plaster slightly above eye level. Celeste slipped the brass loop over the nail, and once more St. Thomas's had a crucifix behind and above its altar platform. Glancing at the rain-streaked windows and the unrelieved night beyond, Joey wondered if P.J. was watching them. What interpretation might he put upon their actions? Did he find these developments laughable or alarming? Joey said, The tableau that he seems to want to create here, a mockery of the twelve apostles arranged in a deconsecrated church at the expense of twelve lives, it's not just an act of madness. 
It's almost an offering. A while ago you said he thinks he's like Judas, the betrayer, betraying his community, his family, his faith, even God, and passing along the corruption wherever he can, pushing thirty dollars into my pocket in his car that night before sending me back to school. Thirty dollars. Thirty pieces of silver. Returning to the altar platform and putting aside the hammer, he grouped the six Christmas candles at one end of the white sheet. Thirty dollars. Just a little symbolic gesture to amuse himself, payment for my cooperation in letting him get away with her murder, making a little Judas out of me. Frowning as she picked up the pack of matches and began to light the candles, Celeste said, So he sees Judas Iscariot as what? Like his patron saint on the dark side? Something like that, I think. Did you just go to hell for betraying Christ, she wondered. If you believe there's a hell, then I guess he has one of the deepest rooms there, Joey said. You, of course, don't believe in hell. Look, it doesn't really matter what I believe in, only what PJ believes in. You're wrong about that. Ignoring her comment, he said, I don't pretend to know all the twists and turns of his delusions, just maybe the overall design of it. I think even a first-rate psychiatrist would have trouble mapping the weird landscape in my big brother's head. As she finished lighting the six bayberry candles, Celeste said, So PJ comes home from New York, takes a ride around the county, and he sees how weird things have gotten here in Coal Valley. All the abandoned houses, the subsidence everywhere, more vent pipes than ever, the open pit of fire out on the edge of town, the church deconsecrated, condemned. It's as if the whole town's sliding into hell. Sliding pretty fast, in fact, and right before his eyes, and it excites him. Is that what you think? Yeah. A lot of psychotics are very susceptible to symbolism. They live in a different reality from ours. In their world, everyone and everything has secret meanings. There are no coincidences. You sound like you've crammed the subject for a test. Over the years, I read a lot of books about aberrant psychology. At first, I told myself it was all research for novels I'd write. Then when I admitted I'd never be a writer, I kept reading as a hobby. But subconsciously, you were trying to understand P.J. A homicidal sociopath with religious delusions of the sort that P.J. seems to have might see demons and angels masquerading as ordinary people. He believes cosmic forces are at work in the simplest events. His world is a place of constant high drama and immense conspiracies. Celeste nodded. She was the principal's daughter, after all, raised in a house full of books. He's a citizen of Paranoia Land. Yeah, okay, so maybe he's been killing for years. Since he went away to college, if not before. One girl here, one there. Little offerings from time to time. But the situation in Coal Valley really gets his juices up. Makes him want to do something special, something big. Joey placed the ceramic statuette of the Holy Mother at the far end of the white sheets from the candles and plugged the cord into a socket on the side of the altar platform. So now we'll screw up his plans by opening the door to God and inviting him back into the church. We'll step straight into PJ's fantasy and fight symbolism with symbolism, counter superstition with superstition. And how will that stop him, she asked, moving to Joey's end of the altar to light the three votive candles in the ruby glasses, which he had carefully arranged in front of the statuette of the Virgin. It'll rattle him, I think. That's the first thing we have to do, rattle him, shake his confidence, and get him to come in out of the darkness where we have a chance at him. He's like a wolf out there, she agreed, just circling beyond the campfire light. He's promised this offering, twelve sacrifices, twelve innocent people, and now he feels he's got to deliver, but he's committed to setting up his tableau of corpses in a church from which God's been driven out. You seem so sure, as if you're in tune with him. He's my brother. It's a little scary, she said. For me, too. But I sense that he needs St. Thomas's. He has no chance of finding another place like it, not tonight. And now that he's started all this, he feels compelled to finish it tonight. If he's watching us right now, he'll see what we're doing, and it'll rattle him, and he'll come in here and make us undo it all. Why won't he just shoot us through the windows, then come in and undo it all himself? He might have handled it that way already if he'd realized soon enough what we were up to, but the moment we hung the crucifix, it was too late. 
even if I'm only half right about his delusions, even if he's only half as deeply lost in his fantasy as I think he is, I don't believe he'll be able to touch a crucifix on a sanctuary wall any more easily than a vampire could. Celeste lit the last of the three votive candles. The altar should have looked absurd, like a playhouse vignette arranged by children engaged in a game of church. Even with their makeshift stage furnishings, however, they had created a surprisingly convincing illusion of a sacred space. Whether it was a function of the lighting or arose by contrast with the starkness of the stripped, deconsecrated, dusty church, an unnatural glow seemed to emanate from the bedsheets on the altar platform, as though they had been treated with phosphorescent dye. They were whiter than the whitest linens that Joey had ever seen. The crucifix lighted from below and at an extreme angle cast an absurdly large shadow across the back wall of the sanctuary, so it almost appeared as though the massive hand-carved icon that had been removed during the deconsecration had now been brought back and lovingly rehung. The flames on the fat Christmas candles all burned strong and steady in spite of myriad cross-drafts in the church. Not one guttered or threatened to go out. By some fluke of positioning and trick of reflection, one of the votive candles in the ruby-red glasses cast a shimmering spot of crimson light on the breast of the small bronze crucifix. We're ready, Joey said. He put the two shotguns on the floor of the narrow presbytery, out of sight but within easy reach. He saw us with the guns earlier, Celeste said. He knows we have them. He won't come close enough to let us use them. Maybe not. It depends on how deeply he believes in his fantasy, how invincible he feels. Turning his back to the altar steps, Joey dropped onto one knee behind the presbytery balustrade that overlooked the choir enclosure. The heavy handrail and the chunky balusters offered some protection from gunfire, but he wasn't under the illusion that they provided ideal cover. The gaps between the balusters were two to three inches wide. Besides, the wood was old and dry. Hollow-point rounds from a high-caliber rifle would chop it into kindling pretty quickly, and some of the splinters would make deadly shrapnel. Kneeling beside him as if reading his mind, Celeste said, It won't be decided with guns anyway. It won't? It's not a question of force. It's a question of faith. As on more than one previous occasion, Joey saw mysteries in her dark eyes. Her expression was unreadable and strangely serene, considering their circumstances. He said, What do you know that I don't know? After meeting his gaze for a long beat, she looked out at the nave and said, Many things. Sometimes you seem... How do I seem? Different. From what? From everyone. A shadow of a smile drew her lips into a suggestion of a curve. I'm not just the principal's daughter. Oh, what else? I'm a woman. More than that, he insisted. Is there more than that? Sometimes you seem much older than you are. There are things I know. Tell me. Certain things. I should know them, too. They can't be told, she said enigmatically, and her pale smile faded. Aren't we in this together, he asked sharply. She looked at him again, eyes widening. Oh, yes. Then if there's anything you know that can help... Deeper than you think, she whispered. What? We're in it together, deeper than you think. Either she was choosing to be inscrutable or there was less mystery in the moment than Joey imagined. She returned her attention to the knave. They were silent. Like the frantic wings of trapped birds struggling to break free, rain and wind beat against the church. After a while, he said, I feel warm. It's been heating up in here for some time, Celeste confirmed. How can that be? We didn't turn on any furnace. It's coming up through the floor, don't you feel it? Through every chink, every crack in the boards. He put his hand on the presbytery floor and discovered that the wood was actually warm to the touch. Celeste said, rising from the ground under the church from the fires far below. Maybe not so far anymore. Remembering the ticking metal box that had stood in the corner of the study at her house, Joey said, Should we be worried about toxic gases? No. Why not? There's worse tonight. Within only a minute or two, a fine dew of perspiration formed on his brow. Searching his jacket pockets for a handkerchief, Joey found a wad of money instead. Two ten-dollar bills, two fives, thirty bucks. 
He kept forgetting that what had happened 20 years in the past had also, in another sense, happened only hours ago. Staring in horror at the folded currency, Joey recalled the persistence with which P.J. had forced it upon him back there in the humid closeness of the parked car. The body hidden in the trunk. The smell of rain heavy in the night. The odor of blood heavier in his memory. He shuddered violently and dropped the money. As they fell out of his hand, the rumpled bills became coins and rang against the wooden floor, making a music like altar bells, glittering, spinning, clinking, wobbling, rattling. They quickly settled into a silent heap beside him. What's that? Celeste asked. He glanced at her. She hadn't seen. He was between her and the coins. Silver, he said. But when he looked again, the coins were gone. Only a wad of paper currency lay on the floor. The church was hot. The window glass, streaming with rain, appeared to be melting. His heart was suddenly racing, pounding like a penitent fist upon the wrong side of his breast. He's coming, Joey said. Where? Rising up slightly, Joey pointed across the balustrade and along the center aisle to the archway at the back of the nave, to the dimly lighted narthex beyond the arch, to the front doors of the church which were barely visible in the shadows. He's coming. <laughs> 